All right, welcome everybody. My name is Caitlin Hughes. I'm the Executive Director with Solar Cookers International. And I'm honored to welcome you to the Solar Cookers International United Nations High Level Political Forum side event. We have an exciting agenda for you in this event. Solar cooking, a cross-cutting solution crucial for advancing and implementing the 2030 agenda of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and for building back better from COVID-19. Next slide, please. Thank you so much for joining. I know we have people joining from all around the world. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This presentation will be recorded and shared afterwards for those who are not available to join us. And we encourage you to share this recording as well. All participants will be muted during the presentation to preserve sound quality. Please type any questions into the question and answer section during the presentation, and we will address them as time allows at the end of the session. Next slide. We have an exciting slate of speakers for you today, including SCI Special Projects Manager, Mindy Fox, SCI Science Director and Main Representative to the United Nations, Dr. Alan Bigelow, SCI Development Director, Lynn Slidem, the Director of Food and Beverage at the Conrad Washington DC Hilton Hotel, Joshua Murray. We also have some special speakers sharing their voices from Haiti including Lordi Racine, Fedna Labine, Rose Bazil, our SCI Global Advisor, and Dr. David Stillman, the Executive Director of the Public-Private Alliance Foundation. Next slide. We are so thankful to have people joining us with all levels of experience related to solar cooking. We have some very experienced solar cooks during our event today, as well as some people who might be hearing about it for the first time. So we'll give a brief overview, including what is a solar cooker. It's a device that collects and absorbs direct sunlight and retains heat to cook food or pasteurize water. It's solar thermal cooking and hundreds of different variations on these basic types exist. Solar cookers are often used with very important complementary technologies such as retain, retained heat baskets and water pasteurization indicators or WAPIs for short, because solar cookers can be used to heat water to make it safe to drink. Some of these types of solar cookers include a reflective panel cooker, a box oven, and a parabolic reflector. Other types of solar cookers on the next slide include Fresnel lenses, Fresnel mirrors, evacuated tubes, and institutional cooking, which can be, for example, a rooftop system involving steam. So who is Solar Cookers International? We are a nonprofit that promotes climate friendly solar cooking to improve human health, economic well being, women's empowerment, and the environment for vulnerable populations worldwide. We've been leading and convening the solar cooking sector since 1987, and we have hundreds of collaborators in over 140 countries. And I'd just like to say a special thank you to our supporters because we could not do this important work without you. So how does Solar Cookers International work to accomplish this? We do this through three main ways, advocacy, research, and building capacity. And we're gonna share with you some examples in terms of how we do this throughout the presentation. So why is solar cooking such an important solution? There's zero air pollution and zero greenhouse gas emissions from solar cooking, zero inhalation of smoke, zero fuel cost, it's a scalable and sustainable solution that's inclusive and equitable, that reduces deforestation and protects biodiversity, provides nutritious meals. It can be used for drying food, which enhances uh, food sustainability. It can pasteurize water. It lessens time and danger from collecting biomass fuel. It's cost-effective and requires no infrastructure. And a couple of facts about household air pollution. To approximately 2.6 billion people cook using polluting open fires or simple stoves fueled by kerosene, coal, and biomass. And that's because they don't have another choice. But solar cooking is a better choice that we are working to provide as an option for folks all around the world. And unfortunately, 3.8 million people die prematurely each year from illnesses attributable to household air pollution caused by polluting cooking practices. And unfortunately, 
one half of the deaths from pneumonia of children under five are caused by particulates inhaled from household air pollution. This is such a, a challenge because it predominantly affects women and children. And so the impacts on current and future generations are just heartbreaking. So what are we doing about it? I'm gonna share with you a little bit more about our advocacy work, especially given that this is a United Nations event. So one of the ways that we work is we encourage government and civil society organizations to include solar cooking in their policies, work and investments. And this includes countries' nationally determined contributions, which are their plans to address climate change. And very relevant to this event, it also includes countries' voluntary national reviews. And these are countries' plans on how to achieve the sustainable development goals. And as good news, solar cooking positively impacts all 17 sustainable development goals. The impacts on people's lives and the world are just enormous. So we've been seeing progress in terms of countries and how they're acknowledging that cooking is such an important part of the solution to addressing so many of these global challenges. So we've been seeing the number of countries who mention solar cooking in their nationally determined contributions to be increasing. Um, but we're working on making sure countries are aware of how important it is to address cooking and especially with the cleanest type of cooking, that's solar cooking. And just as a, a really easy fact to remember, one simple solar cooker can save one family from burning one ton of wood in the year. Now, if we imagine that multiplied by the approximately 2.6 billion, with a B, people cooking over open fires, the impacts for people and our planet are just incredible. I also want to highlight the number of countries that have a stated interest in non-polluting cooking fuels, and that number has been going up as well. So hopefully we'll see this entire pie chart uh, to be orange in the future. That's what we're working on. Another way that we work to advocate for solar cooking is by making sure people are aware of it and aware of the great work that Solar Cookers International and many of our collaborators are doing around the world. We've been very fortunate to be highlighted in some very prominent publications, including CNN International, Washington Post, The New Yorker, Manga Bay, Studio Sacramento, and Hudson Valley. You are welcome to come to our website, solarcookers.org, um, and find, find these articles and share them as well, as that is one way that you can be a part of the solar cooking movement and help educate other people about this important solution. And I will turn it over to SCI Special Projects Manager, Mindy Fox, to share more about how SCI works to build capacity. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you everyone out there for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, Alan, can you go to our next slide? Thank you. So why and how does SCI build capacity? You are soon to hear from some experienced and passionate solar cookers and solar cooking advocates, and they all have inspiring stories about expanding solar cooking around the globe. And SCI actively works to connect these people you will hear from and others in the solar cooking sector through resource development and resource sharing to build capacity. We're doing that so collectively we can scale up to reach the approximate 2.6 billion people still cooking with polluting fuels. All solar cooking collaborators are encouraged to utilize, contribute to, and share these solar cooking resources to increase the adoption of solar cooking worldwide. With increased use, more people around the world will reap the many benefits of solar cooking. So let me highlight a few of these resources now. Next slide, Alan, thanks. This slide shows an interactive map on the SCI website depicting solar cookers around the world. Each dot on the map represents someone using a solar cooking, a solar cooker and living a healthier life. SCI obtains data from both solar cooks and solar cooker distributors on an ongoing basis. We then publish that identified solar cooker on this global map. The map provides increased visibility to solar cooking collaborators and current and potential solar cooking collaborators use the map to then connect with each other. In addition, the collected data allows SCI to quantify 
the ever-growing impacts of using solar cookers around the planet. Currently, over 4 million solar cookers have been identified. Estimates, estimates indicate that those cookers are directly impacting over 14 million people and over 7.7 .7 billion meals have been cooked using solar cookers. That's rather mind boggling. We know that using one solar cooker can allow a family to avoid using one ton of firewood per year, as Caitlin just mentioned, which saves them time and money, and it avoids carbon dioxide emissions. The identified 4 million solar cookers are estimated to be avoiding over 30 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions over their lifetime. Using the United States Environmental Protection Agency's greenhouse gas equivalency calculator, it's estimated that preventing the release of 30 million tons of carbon dioxide is equal to not driving gasoline powered cars for 76 billion miles. The next slide shows more about the impacts of solar cooking. Countries can save millions, even billions of dollars annually through avoided health and environmental costs by incorporating solar cooking into their cooking practices. We've created these impact sheets for over 100 countries to show the estimated savings that countries can experience. Each impact summary shows the number of solar cookers currently identified in a country, those dots on our map, and the population number and population percentage in a country relying on polluting fuels for cooking. The summaries also show the carbon dioxide tons prevented with the current solar cookers and the potential carbon dioxide tons prevented if the families cooking with polluting fuels used solar cooking. These summaries then provide estimated savings for each country, some of which are in the billions of dollars annually. Estimates show that if everyone cooking with polluting fuels cooked with solar thermal cookers one quarter of the time, over $1 trillion could be saved annually across the globe. That is trillion with a T. So just think of the impact on people's lives and the environment. Let's look at our next resource. This slide highlights two SCI resources that are invaluable to many people. The first is the Solar Cooking Wiki, the world's largest online solar cooking resource with over 1,800 pages of information about country-specific solar cooking tips, how to build solar cookers, and news and events. The Solar Cooking Wiki is just a wealth of helpful information. Information on the wiki can be translated into 45 languages, so people can explore and add their own information to this powerful resource. SEI is not the is not the only source of content for the wiki. Hundreds of people put up their wiki pages, thousands actually, and provide content to this. So lots of great stories and information are housed here. The second resource on this slide is the John Collentine Solar Cooking Toolkit, named after a well-known and very well-loved solar cooking advocate. This is an online resource organized into modules that you see here on the slide for multiple audiences with different needs. It contains appropriate information for, say, a novice solar cook wanting to look for a recipe or uh, the beginnings how-to info, or for an energy minister looking to scale up solar cooking initiative in their country. And it's all laid out in a very user-friendly and effective manner. Let's look at the surveys next. SCI developed two surveys as part of our recommended best practices for conducting solar cooking projects. The survey's goals are to help everyone implement successful solar cooking initiatives and then add to the evidence base. These two surveys have questions that should be asked at three different moments in time, before a project starts, before cooks start using their solar cookers, and after solar cooks have been solar cooking for at least six months. The first survey is the quick need survey, which helps assess the need and desire for solar cooking in a community. This assessment is just critical. It's a foundational step in creating a successful solar cooking initiative. 
The survey seeks answers from participants regarding what is important to current cooks about the type of stoves they currently use, if their drinking water needs to be made safe to drink, what fuels are currently being used, is cooking done indoors or outdoors, and if people are interested in receiving solar cooking training. The compiled data can help planners, project managers, decision makers formulate the appropriate solar cooking initiative in their community. The second survey uh, we created was completed with the help of solar cooking experts from around the world, and it's the Adoption and Impact Survey. It gathers baseline and post-distribution data that quantifies the use and impact of solar cookers in an initiative. And this is critical information for everyone in the solar cooking sector to have. Used consistently, these survey results add to the evidence base and help calculate the global impacts of solar cooking. And this evidence base is then critically important in seeking funding and expanding the growth of solar cooking initiatives around the planet. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Alan Bigelow, our Science Director in the United Nations Main Rep, who will share information about SEI's efforts of building solar cooking capacity in Kakuma Refugee Camp. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mindy. Uh, to make the transition here, I will be including mention of the Quick Needs Assessment and the Adoption and Impact Survey in the story about what we are doing with the collaboration in Kenya. And this has been going on for several years now, and it is picking up steam, so to speak. Uh, so we're, we're excited to share some of the recent images from, from what's happening at Kakuma Refugee Camp in Northern Kenya. To start, I just want to show this picture as a reference because this is really why we're doing the work we're doing. It's, it's one picture of why we're doing the work we're doing. And this is a picture that I took when visiting a home in Kenya in a village. And I would say this is a typical scene where the cooking is happening indoors um, using firewood. And so there's a lot of smoke in this room that can lead to health effects. And the, the wife of the family is multitasking while cooking. She's also doing dishes and tending to a child who is uh, also breathing in the smoke uh, from that fire. So this is something that is occurring on a regular basis. And meanwhile, outdoors, there's a great amount of sunshine. So that's an opportunity. Now, in this next picture, this is from Kakuma Refugee Camp, and this is at a cooking fuels market. These markets just spring up. They, they're like pop-up markets that, that open up on, on a daily basis. And what happens here is that the host community, meaning Kenyans who are living in that area, this is in Turkana County, so Turkana people, are bringing in charcoal and firewood to sell to the refugees who are living there. And one reason why this is happening is that the agencies that are tasked to provide cooking fuel for the refugees are not able to provide enough. So there's an insufficient supply of cooking fuel. And now this leads to hardship for the refugees who have to decide what they're gonna do. Um, some other options might be to try to find cooking fuel on their own. However, that's not allowed, that uh, they're not able to go and scavenge for cooking fuel in this circumstance. So, and, and if they do, that can lead to some some trauma. Uh, there, there are documented cases of, of um, sexual violence uh, on, toward women and young girls who are scavenging for fuel. So uh, the other option, if um, the family has some cash, some money, they might be able to purchase cooking fuel at a market such as one of these. 
Or if they don't have cash, they might be able to barter some of their food rations for cooking fuel. Again, this is happening on a regular basis. And meanwhile, there's an abundance of sunshine in Northern Kenya, which you see in this photo. You can see the, the sun landing on the, on the ground, on the people, <laughs> evidenced by the shadows that you also see. Okay, so what, what this has led is to uh, is that SCI has an ongoing collaboration with a local organization in Kenya that is manufacturing solar cookers and locally using locally sourced material and using an open source design plan. So this is, uh, is really leading to a lot of national pride for, for being able to do this in Kenya with, uh, with a Kenyan made solar cooker. So um, in, during our quick needs assessment, the, the enumerators, the, the people who are third party to this, uh, this effort, meaning that uh, they, they have a neutral position, they, they go and they talk to potential participants. And while they're gathering information about the, um, the willingness to use a solar cooker, the need, uh, perhaps also their access to sun, there, there are a number of questions on, on that survey. They also take pictures now. And so we see here just three examples of the cooking solutions that are in place. For, for these three participants who were selected for, for this year's round of, of work. So you can see that they're all using some form of combustible fuel, firewood or charcoal in, in this case. Now onto manufacturing. Um, this year we're, we're working with a standard size solar box oven, which is being assembled here and 108 Solar ovens were, were constructed and then brought to the Kakuma refugee camp. This picture shows a couple things. One is that it really helps to have your cookware um, painted black or uh, darkened uh, some way because basic physics uh, can explain that with black cookware, um, they're more efficient at absorbing sunlight and converting uh, the energy from sunlight to transform that into heat energy. So here you're, you're seeing the, the painting of the pots, the, the, the cookware is being painted a matte black color. Um, and then this also shows the contribution from the refugees that they are also, they're willing to, to uh, use their own cookware and to have it painted black for uh, the participation in this initiative. So that, that is uh, what you see here, is that the, the, the pots are painted black and those will be used with these solar ovens. Training is an essential aspect to a project. So in SCI's best practices, we uh, see here two pictures of the hands-on component of, of the training session. There are also uh, classroom aspects here, uh, lecture-based training. Um, but when it comes to the hands-on part, this is where the refugees really get to taste the food, to see firsthand how it works. And the training sessions are also being uh, partly led by some of the refugee uh, solar cooking champions from previous cycles. So we are, we're really uh, excited to see how that is propagating and helping to, to continue this, this effort. To, to have someone from the local community to be able to share with, with others living there, their own experience and their own confidence level, the, the rationale for solar cooking is transferred to, to the next uh, group of users in a very efficient manner. So uh, the, the three women that you saw earlier pictured with their, their cooking solutions pre-solar, uh, before the project started, here they are again with, uh, with the solar ovens that they received. And um, I can see that there, there's a level of, of excitement and confidence in, in, their, in, their, in their face when, uh, when they receive their solar ovens. 
And that, that level of, of, of excitement and um, confidence comes through again when they actually solar cook and feed members of their families. So we're, again, ex so, so excited to see these images coming in from this year's initiative. And these images uh, both show children. Uh, the image on the left, obviously, there's a child right in front being fed. But notice the reflector. What do you see in the reflector in the picture on the right? There's um, there's a child <laughs> who is eager to, to have some of that solar cooked food. So th this truly is empowering to, to these women, refugees at Kakuma refugee camp. Um, I, I need to give an update about, the, uh, about what this really means for them in terms of the situation at Kakuma refugee camp has shifted from some or local organizations supplying firewood, even though it's insufficient, they're no longer doing that. Now they've switched to a, a cash supply. So they're, they're providing cash to refugees so that refugees can purchase cooking fuel. Um, we have uh, been hearing some aspects about that. It, it doesn't sound very promising that the cash delivery is happening in a timely manner. So this, this is making it all the more important that, that these women are able to solar cook. And from some of our previous initiatives, we found that through our adoption and impact survey that, that one family can save on the order of several, several US dollars per week by being able to reduce their expense on cooking fuel because they are solar cooking with free solar energy from the sun. I can't finish a presentation about <laughs> what we're doing collaboratively in Kenya without showing some of the, the food items that are cooked. So this is all from this year. These pictures show a variety of, of food items that are being solar cooked in these solar ovens. So you see peas, rice, beans, uh, a potato and tomato stew. It looks delicious, and rice and beans. So there, there, there are many factors that go into an initiative like this. And so at, at SCI, we understand that there, there are many questions that, that others have about the aspects of, of this particular work and um, how they might be able to apply it to their initiatives. And while we, we realize that there are so many unique factors to one particular initiative that's based on the location, the materials availability, the resources that the collaborators may have, we, um, we'd be happy to go into more detail uh, about that if, if, um, if another entity is, uh, another organization is interested in, in approaching a consultancy type of agreement with SCI. So thanks for, for your questions, but also please understand that there are so many unique factors to um, specific projects. That this, this is really project specific information. Okay, um, I'd like to switch gears now to, to solar drying in that with solar drying, um, as, as Caitlin mentioned earlier in the benefits of solar cookers that you do have the opportunity to use the same type of technology and approaches using solar thermal uh, for preserving food. And in, in this situation shown here, there is a model research center for, for value addition. And that really does give the point across and that you are able to increase the yield from, from a farm, from uh, reducing uh, crop waste um, possibly in transition or transit to the market, but you could you could dry crops uh, on location in the field, literally, and then this does raise the 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 value of of the the crops. They can be um, sold at a, a higher price, but also an opportunity for entrepreneurs to really take uh, take on a business approach that, um, that that's showcased here with a, a variety of dried crops um, and including pumpkin flour is just one example. 
So with sol solar drying, SCI is, is very uh, excited to also uh, share a lot of resources about solar drying. And, and some of us actually do our own solar drying. <laughs> so in, in, this, um, in this slide, um, the, the top picture, of the direct heat dryer. That, that's one approach where you could use a solar cooker as a solar dryer by, by just keeping the lid open a little bit so that the moisture can escape and that the heat also doesn't get up to a cooking temperature, but just uh, at the point where you're expelling moisture and uh, drying, um, in, in this case, I'm, I'm, I was drying peppers and um, tomatoes from our garden. And um, those I'm able to, to continue using for several months um, here in our, in our home. Uh, also, there, there are updraft solar dryers. One is pictured here uh, with the schematic. And then the solar tunnel dryer is a very effective and low cost solution that, that can be built um, with local materials uh, very easily. The SCI has a number of design plans on our solar cooking wiki that we host. And um, not only are there design plans for the household level um, of use, but, but there are also designs for uh, communal dryers. And then taking it up to a, a higher level, really scaling up, there are, are industry level solar dryers where large quantities of, of, of food items are are dried and then can be sold in, in a dried form. All right, so with that, I'd now like to, uh, to, to, to change gears again and introduce a new colleague at SCI. So Lynn Slidem joined us recently and she is our new development director at SCI. So I'll let Lynn take over here and introduce herself at, 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 with more uh, more, more in depth, and um, then she will guide the next conversation. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much, Alan, um, and to everyone who is joining us today to learn more about solar cooking. I am Lynn Slidem. I'm the Development Director of Solar Cookers International. I've been working in the public sector for about 30 years. And I'm a returned Peace Corps volunteer, as well as a United Nations volunteer. My role with SCI is to gain resources and meet those who share our mission of clean cooking. And that's why I'm so happy to introduce Chef Josh Murray, uh, who is the Director of Food and Beverage at the Conrad Washington, DC. And along with making wonderful solar cooked foods, <laughs> Chef Murray has also earned, he's earned numerous medals in American Culinary Federation competitions, restaurant awards, television appearances, and has been featured in signature chef events and in multiple publications. So welcome Chef Murray. Um, I'd like to ask if you could tell us how a luxury brand um, like Conrad Washington DC began its solar cooking adventure. Lynn, thank you so much, first of all, and, and congratulations to everybody that's affiliated with uh, Solar Cookers International. The work you all are doing on a humanitarian front is absolutely incredible. Um, it's an honor to be, be a part of this panel today. Um, yeah, if, if you click to the next slide, um, you know, the story uh, of how this got started was very interesting. So you know, the pandemic affected the globe in many, many ways. And, and so uh, when we reopened the hotel after it had been closed for a while, um, and we began to systematically open up the operation again, one of the components that we tried to get up and running uh, was Summit. And it was really important for us to really reflect on some of the worst times of what was taking place with uh, COVID-19 and the awareness that came about with social and environmental issues. And what an amazing uh, opportunity to take and really uh, drive the concept of summit in that direction. And so one of the opportunities that we had on the rooftop and really where it all began was some of the lighting components of the space. And while I spent some time uh, uh, not working in, in the industry um, during COVID-19, I spent time redoing my own personal house with a lot of solar lighting and components like that. 
And as I began to look to use the solar lighting as a resource uh, for the rooftop, it kind of just sent me down this uh, bit of a rabbit hole and, and solar cooking and solar cookers. And it took me back to my childhood where I would make nachos as a kid uh, with a solar cooker. And then along came this idea of, well, let's use this. We're on a rooftop. Uh, we're already going to be using solar. Uh, the hotel itself is, is incredibly committed uh, in its development of, um, of, of being lead gold. Uh, in addition to that, all of our sustainability practices. And so I find this, uh, this solar box and I get the idea to do uh, solar pork barbecue in it. Um, and so I literally turned it into a smoker and it started there. Uh, and then we said to ourselves, well, let's look at some other issues that uh, or other topics that we have to, to embrace. And that's when we in year one turned um, our wine list into all women made wines. Um, and then we started featuring gay owned breweries. And we really set out on this mission to allow people to come into a luxury rooftop environment, experience incredible food and beverage and provoke that question. Um, next slide. And so when we talk about some of the things that, that Conrad Washington, D.C., and even, you know, Hilton and the Conrad brand really embody, you know, the hotel, as mentioned before, was set out to be built lead gold. 27% um, of all the materials used to build this building are recycled materials. 97% um, of the rainwater is recycled. It's collected. It goes to watering our rooftop terraces and also the garden and the glass initiatives that we have. Um, with using the garnishes, uh, um, you know, in our cocktail program that are grown on the roof. Uh, that also helps keep the roof much cooler. We've got uh, complimentary EV charging uh, ports inside of the um, parking garage as well. We've got in-room sensors, um, you know, that monitor and really cut down on the consumption of energy as well. And, and the other piece is, is from a food and beverage perspective, we were already committed to taking all of those initiatives to a much higher level anyway. Uh, and so that comes through the, you know, the facet of doing composting within the building, the recycling of oyster shell program, uh, a vertical approach to local sourcing. Um, you know, people talk about doing locally sourced product, but for us, it's not good enough to do that. Um, and point being is, is that we have an, a vendor, um, Autumn Olive Farms, that is our pork provider. Uh, not only are they within a very small geographical window, but they also use their pigs to uh, eradicate invasive plant species on their farms. Uh, so you look not just for somebody that embodies uh, great farming, but how are they also contributing to the next level of sustainability uh, to go along with that. And then we also do massive amounts of food donations to feeding the homeless in Washington, DC. Um, so really uh, with the support of, of Hilton that you know was built over a hundred years ago with the belief that hospitality is truly a force uh, that can have uh, be a power for good uh, and Hilton's commitment to, to the ESG uh, segment sector of everything that they're looking to do um, you know they have a travel with purpose program uh, so once all of these ideas got going and started tying in significantly with what we're doing on the rooftop it just kind of ran from there yeah I was very impressed with the hotel and they have not left one stern stone unturned, I think, when it comes to sustainability. So could you walk us through how you use the cooker and prepare meals? We've been hearing how other cultures do it. How does the, the summit? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's pretty interesting. So um, as you can see in the photo, uh, that's a box style solar cooker. Um, you know, it, it started out with a significant amount of R&D, right? Research and design on how is this going to work and how do I take something that, you know, up until this point, I didn't really know of anybody that had applied it um, to, uh, you know, a, a um, industrial restaurant. I mean, I've learned more about it now at this point, but so I, it started off with me just sticking the box in the window to see how hot it would get and very quickly went up to 250 degrees without being outdoors and my mind was just blown. And so that R&D, once it got to the rooftop, turned into how hot can I get this box to begin with? And then once you learn that the pedestal in the back is basically your thermostat and the angle of which you direct it into the sun is a portion of how you also control that temperature. I just took my training and my experiences with regards to doing pork barbecue. 
I put this, you know, dry rubbed everything like I normally would put it inside this box. I injected the box with a little bit of smoke, locked it in there, took the temperature very quickly up to 375 so that I could uh, get the temperature of the meat where it needs to be for health code. Right. And then drop that temperature back down and slow roasted it. And, you know, the thing is, is at the end of the day, it's an oven. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's not complicated when you actually understand the simplicity of what you're working with. And, and so the other component of it is, is how do we, how do we plan? Uh, because obviously when we're open, we're open. And if the sun's not out for any reason, you have to be able to, uh, accomplish what you need to. So you're literally paying attention to the weather and you take advantage of the weather when you can. Um, and then you put yourself in a position to, to execute uh, service uh, with the items that you prepped in that format. And, and I think the, the great thing is, too, is that the next phase of this up until this point, the majority of everything that we've been preparing has really been focused on what we do in the preparation phase and not in the in your face visual component um of the operation and and so now we're actually in uh injecting uh solar fondue and solar brew teas um so that guests can actually see what's taking place with the solar cooking uh right in front of them so we have a another slide here that shows some of the fantastic foods that i was able to partake um and could you tell us a little bit about the solar dryer that you're holding here yeah so one of the things that you know we like to do obviously in the luxury world is make sure that all of our cocktails are very well garnished and take on the presentation uh that we look for and, and in that we do dehydrated lime chips and uh, various uh other uh, uh garnishments for that and again keep in mind this is tying in once again to the garden the glass initiative that goes into our roof got gardens and so we hang this up on really nice uh non-humid days and we layer all of our garnishes in there and dehydrate those and again yet another set of circumstances where you have to take advantage of the days that are ideal for this type of preservation um, and understand your environment and so we get ahead on those things and once you've actually preserved them by dehydration then the shelf life on those is incredibly long and incredibly stable um, you know and some of the other pictures in the top left uh, that's uh, our car carrot hummus uh, that we do roast it inside of the solar oven as well. Uh, down in the bottom right corner, uh, that's our pork belly uh, bow buns that we're doing this year as well. Uh, and then down in the bottom left corner was again, the pork barbecue that we actually did in year one. And now that we're in year two, we just evolved the menu to keep things kind of fresh. Oh, it's fantastic. So what is next for the Conrad in our nation's capital? Well, I mean, you know, if you had asked me that question last year when we started playing with the solar, I, I don't know that I would have said sitting here on this panel today would have been where we got to. <laughs> um, and so I think with that answer, the sky is the limit. Um, you know, sustainability is incredibly important, incredibly important to me as an individual. Um, it's incredibly important to the hotel. Um, it's incredibly important to Hilton. And I think as these ideas continue to evolve and develop, it really gives you an opportunity to design things intentionally. And Hilton has an objective to be able to reduce their carbon footprint by 50% by 2030, which is an amazing uh, goal that they're looking to do. Um, they just uh, um, opened up a zero net carbon footprint hotel in New Haven, Connecticut um, called uh, uh, the Marcel. Uh, and again, it's if, if you set out with the intentions to be able to accomplish these things, it makes it even more amazing what you can accomplish uh, at the end of the day, and especially with an organization as large as Hilton. So you know, it's it's the boots on the grounds kinds of things every day that kind of uncover these components and, and much like the work that SCI is doing, um, it, it really shows what can be done when a bunch of people come together to accomplish some really amazing objectives. Yeah, well, you all have done an amazing job and we really look forward to following your future success. I want to thank you and the Conrad Washington for all that you do. Um, could quite possibly be the first and only hotel brand in the United States, as far as SCI knows, is aware of, that actually incorporates solar cooking into its menu. So we want to congratulate you for that. And now I'd like to pass the baton uh, to Alan, who can provide more information on SCI's research efforts. Thank Thanks so much. Thank you. 
Wow, thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Chef Joshua Murray. That was exciting, and I was waiting for this day to come, <laughs> that we would be able to highlight solar cooking um, in the hospitality industry here in the United States, so that you've, you've really made some ground breaking progress and we're looking forward to more. Uh, but really congratulations for, for what you've done you know, at the Conrad and sustainability overall, but also in, in the realm of solar cooking. Okay, um, shifting gears now to some of our research that we do at, at SCI. I'm a physicist, so I, um, I really latch on to these aspects of what we do. And what got this bucket of work started was, was really that there was a, an identified need in the solar cooking sector. Back in 2014, I had attended an SCI meeting, uh, an international conference, and there was this need that was identified that uh, there needs to be an internationally agreed upon method for testing solar cookers. At that time, there wasn't one. And so that led to quite a bit of confusion within the sector. There were various manufacturers claiming that their solar cooker was the best one, that it was number one, and that was confusing to consumers and um, others who might be at, uh, at a high impact opportunity to deploy solar cookers at large. So um, SCI decided to step in and, and take, take on this, this need. And SCI was well positioned to do that given its brand agnostic stance, meaning that it doesn't prefer one brand over another and, and actually had, had stopped manufacturing itself. So SCI no longer had a perceived conflict of interest that would uh, affect the, the ability to carry out an, um, a, a testing program. So uh, fortunately at that very time, there, there is a bit of a story to this, uh, but the, the, the year prior to that, that conference that I just referenced, there was a work item that started up at the International Organization for Standardizations, ISO, and uh, TC285, that's TC stands for Technical Committee, was working, it just started working on standards for clean cook stoves and clean cooking solutions. And these, these, um, certainly includes solar cookers. So solar cookers fit in very well with this work. Now, the, the work that was done um, was, a, was a collaboration among experts from a number of countries that congregated um, either in person or online. It's, it's been happening over a number of years now and wrote the, the standards and not only wrote them, published them. So in 2018 and 2019, uh, standards for laboratory protocol and field protocol were published respectively. So this, this has been a, a great uh, set of publications for the clean cooking sector and, and of course the solar cooking sector. So what does this mean? This, this brings credibility to, to these sectors and also um, it raises consumer confidence when, when someone is going to, uh, to purchase a solar cooker or decide which one they might need for their application. Uh, they, they can have informed uh, decisions uh, based on results from testing. Um, this, this also helps drive the business. If, if there are standards that, that can lead to performance specifications that can be added to product, that, that can really help drive the business. So with uh, this added consumer confidence and, and, uh, cons con uh, and consumer um, uh, having, uh, consumers having informed choices, I wanna tell you what we did at SCI, what we did um, uh, thanks to our colleague, Justin Tabachnik, who is our re research specialist, we've developed the performance evaluation process. And basically what this does is it's a, a test station picture here. It, it's essentially a small weather station, uh, has components for measuring temperature, wind speed, and solar irradiance, how much solar energy is, is there present uh, during the, the test. And, and this system automates the protocol that are in the ISO standards that I was just mentioning. 
And ultimately, this produces a single, single measure of thermal performance uh, known as the standard cooking power. And this is a, a value in watts. Now, what, what is that? <laughs> a lot of people wonder, well, what does that mean? And if, uh, if you happen to recall what you might have experienced at a freshman level in chemistry or physics class, if you happen to have taken those courses in, in school, um, you might recall um, your, your teacher taking a beaker of water and heating it over a Bunsen burner and, and monitoring the temperature and taking into account the amount of water, um, the temperature, temperature change over time. That's essentially what this system does, is that it, it uses that type of basic uh, equation to, pr to produce the standard cooking power in watts. So this is something that's replicable. We're, uh, we're able to do these tests um, on one day to the next day. And we, we normalize the data based on how much solar energy was there on a particular test date. So that, that's one way that it, it really makes it replicable. So this is uh, the solar cooking sectors um, ability to bring credibility to the sector now through testing. We've now um, duplicated this in, in several locations. We test at SCI in the United States, in California, but, and also in New York where, where I'm based. But also we have collaborators in Nepal and in Kenya that we're working with for, for uh, testing solar cookers. So this is a very exciting way to also bring uh, more knowledge um, and ownership of, of this ability. So it, it, this also fits into our capacity, capacity building aspect of SCI. A lot of overlap between our buckets. So what have we, what have we tested so far? Well, as, I, as you heard, I mentioned the, the publications only came out a few years ago. So this is still a very young program. But here are, the, here are pictures of solar cookers that we have tested with the performance evaluation process and the manufacturer of these solar cookers has, uh, the manufacturers of the various solar cookers have given us written permission to, to post the results of those cookers on our website. So here you see reflective panels, a variety of, um, also a variety of box ovens and evacuated tube cookers that, that we have been testing at, at SCI or using the, the performance evaluation process. So what do these results look like at the end of the day? I was mentioning it's a single unit of measure. And uh, this is a screenshot from our website. Um, it, uh, uh, we have a research section on our, on our website at SCI. And you can find this table and it lists the solar cooker by name alphabetically. And then also in the next column, there is a link to uh, more about that specific cooker on the Solar cooker, solar cooking wiki, and from there you can read more about that that cooker and, and contact the manufacturer. Um, so those are the standard cooking power values that we've measured, and what those values are are the uptake power values. So how much power um, is taken up in a load of water that's in the solar cooker. So water does take quite a bit to to heat up, but in each case here. These, these are solar cookers that, that can reach the boiling point, they can boil water, so they can certainly cook food. And so we're, we're excited about uh, being able to showcase um, these, these solar cookers now. Um, they, these are color coded by type. So you have the orange being the reflective panel cookers, green being box ovens, and purple being the evacuated tubes. Uh, one more thing to look for on, on the solar cookers that have been tested is this logo that I just added. It's the SCI PEP tested logo. So this is something that you'll see on the wiki pages for those solar cookers. And we encourage the manufacturer to add that to their, their cooker themselves and um, showcase that. So uh, another way that we showcase this work is um, by presenting it as we're doing here today. And during a recent uh, conference, um, the Solar World Congress, we, we presented this work as well and uh, wrote it up and submitted a manuscript and it is just now published. So I wanted to uh, put a picture of that uh, abstract 
um, on this slide. So um, um, feel free to to uh, jot down that that link and um, read all about it. <laughs> okay, now I'd like to switch gears um, from household level solar cookers, which I've been talking about, and, and it's the household levels. Um, cookers, clean cookers that all those uh, standards that I mentioned addressed. But how about another level of solar cooker, the institutional cook stoves? Well, um, a new work item was proposed to the ISO Technical Committee 285 um, a couple years ago by Uganda. The country of Uganda suggested that there needs to be standards for institutional cookers. Well, um, that work item was accepted and work now is underway for, for uh, creating those standards. SCI is involved as uh, we are a part of the US delegation to those, uh, those standards. And so um, part of uh, my job is to ensure that, that the solar cooking sector is represented. So what you see here is um, a rooftop system and this is at the Vajra Academy in Nepal. It's, it's a, um, a school where there are some students who board there and they need to eat. So the, the food is, is cooked with a system such as this one. And, and these systems are, are actually hybrid systems. So while they are primarily meant for um, solar steam uh, to cook the food, they can also run on a backup system that the, the Institute may already have had in place. So this uh, is very interesting in how this intersects with the ISO work item on institutional cook stoves because it also might um, have a backup system that is using biomass or, or uh, gas, um, electricity. There's, there's a variety of, of hybrid approaches. Um, but this system on, on the top of this school is, is very exciting. Um, it pumps steam down into a, uh, a kitchen after being heated by the, the rooftop collectors. And then this is a very modern looking um, kitchen that, that cooks uh, all kinds of food. It pictured here are momos, a type of dumpling that is very delicious, I can, I can attest. <laughs> um, and the students just love this. And not, not only do the students enjoy the food, but they also get training in how to run that system. So that, that's a very exciting aspect um, of what's ahead with, with the ISO work. And um, we're, we're very excited to be involved with, with this initiative in really scaling solar cooking um, to the institution level with standards for measuring performance. Next, I'd like to move on from, from standards and research and uh, shift gears to, to our next speakers. So I'd like to introduce Lourdes Racine, who is the directrice of a community center in Marion, Haiti. This is along the southern coast of Haiti. And uh, I've met Lourdes in 2018 and um, was able to enjoy some of her cooking. So I'm gonna now let her speak um, in, the, in the next slide. Her video will start. I just want to give you a heads up that the audio in this video and the one to follow um, might be different from what you're hearing right now from my voice. So feel free to use your own volume controls on your computer or your headset to raise and or lower the volume as, as you need. Okay, so uh, on the next slide, one more, one more note is that Lourdes speaks in French slash Haitian Creole. So to help you understand, we've provided a, a translation or a summary in English on, on the side so you can get, you can get the overall uh, view of what she's saying. Okay, so here is Lourdes Racine. Merci, Madame. Lourdes Jacotin Racine, directrice en animaux Centre Communautaire de Marion, mais on bénéficie dans le programme Ressources solaires et Biodigesteurs. Donc, moi, j'ai utilisé Ressources solaires depuis 2015. Dans le programme, ça a moins bénéficié en plus. Le programme, ça a aidé à économiser. Le programme, ça a aidé à économiser au moins. Le programme ça aide tout 
eh, et de économiser santé dans le domaine santé moins il est moins donc à utiliser chapeau mon papa chapeau du coup donc pour l'homme ça y est ou vraiment bon moi vraiment 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 remet programme ça y est moi pas et regret pour que les deux de programme ça y est c'est bio digestif et réchaud solaire donc moi bénéficie de programme ça y est c'est bien ça KDCK IPF et sur la coupe. Donc, euh, moi, ben, c'est un bel programme. Moi, pas regret pour te bénéficier programme ça. Moi, j'aime un programme dans le Et moi, je dis, pas de CK, IPIF, sur la coupe. Merci un peu pour l'effort, pour le travail nous fait qui permet de bénéficier de programme. Moi, j'aime un programme. Nan. Merci, moi, souhaitez bon Dieu, bénis nous pour support nous dans nou, la question de la soleil. Je me suis lavé, je fait toute activité pour manger ma cuite dans le soleil. Ça a aidé à me bénéficier. Non seulement dans le domaine de santé, l'âge, ça a aidé à me bouler. Trop de charbon, bouler un peu de gaz. Je me suis lavé programme. Nan. Et je me suis lavé programme. Je me suis décidé. Je suis d'accord. Je me suis volonté pour permettre tout Haïti de bénéficier dans le programme. Ça, même si je me bénéficier, c'est un bel programme. Je me suis lavé. Je moi, je voulais travailler en collaboration avec nous pour tout Haïti, Rive Join, un tel programme comme ça. J'ai moi-même moi bénéficié de mon sentiment à l'aise là-dedans pour l'autre chose, finalement, pas bénéficier du programme non? et bénéficier de la santé, bénéficier de la gagner, économiser tant de Merci, merci KDCK, merci PPF, merci sur la coupe. Ciao, merci. We are so thankful to have these voices coming from Haiti. And next we get to hear from Fedno Lubin, who is a photographer and solar cook. Fighting charcoals with solar cooking in Haiti. Haiti was once called the field of the Antilles. Most of us depend on charcoal for cooking. We make our trees into charcoal. We destroy the environment, breathe smoke, damage our health. We run our tomorrows in order to eat the day. And we are always spending money for fuel. Is solo cooking an option? for a better future? I have seen the damage and I'm exploring the possibilities. Let's encourage innovation to improve our lives. What can we do to stop the damage? Sensitize youth and adult to the importance of the environment. The environment is our good, our life, we need to protect it. Solar cookers can help us fight against deforestation and pollution. With a solar cooker, food is more delicious and retains its vitamins.
By the power of the sun, we can use the solar cooker to make our food like rice and beans, macaroni salad, salad bruce. We can make also our corns. We can boil banana in the solar cooker. We can do everything. Also, with the solar cooker, we can raise some money. Instead of buying fuel or charcoal, we can raise that money to increase the amount of the, of the food. I am Fedna Lubin. Thank you everyone for watching. Thank you to the Private Islands Foundation, PPEF. And next, we'd like to invite SCI Global Advisor, Rose Bazil. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Kathleen. It's always my pleasure to talk about uh, solar cooking. I am from Haiti. Haiti is rich on, in sunshine, and it's my dream to see every Haitian use solar cooking to save trees, to protect their health and their economy. Next, please. Uh, I was asked by Dr. Alan Bigelow to focus on uh, sustainable development uh, goal four, to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote uh, lifelong learning opportunity for all. And this is exactly what we're doing in Haiti. We include everyone, except we don't get to the government yet because Haiti has been having a lot of problem with, with government lately. And uh, we, want to, we want to work with certain candidates uh, in the future that would, um, when we have election, so we can include government into our uh, pro teaching program. Next. This is Mayette, Haiti. It's my hometown um, where we have the, the children learning about solar cooking. We try to go across the curriculum um, uh, with solar cooking so the children will grow up using solar cooking and don't use trees charcoal wood and charcoal or propane. And in the middle is uh, Marie Flor. Marie Flor is uh, a, a teacher and she was cooking plantain and, uh, and spinach. And the children, they enjoyed that. They were very amazed that they can use sunlight to solar cook. Next. And then we go to high school, Maranata High School, where they, they were also thrilled to learn that they can use solar cooking. So we provide them with knowledge and then we have solar cooking solar cooker available so they have equity to empower to continue solar cooking in Haiti. Next. Here in uh, in Mont Blanc Public School, we also teach and the children were excited. They eat uh, from this, uh, uh, food cooked from sunlight. Next. And this is at the community center, which we try to make an oven, a solar oven in the backyard. So this is Ludi, she was, she baked bread in that solar oven. So we had some spot solar oven available that was damaged. So we used them to, to do, uh, to, uh, to make solar oven. So we can use we can use local material to teach them how to make solar oven. This is a big step. Some people come and see and they want to go home and build one. Next. We do teaching in church. This is in church in Marion, my hometown, where we have everybody involved. We have the 
um, the women especially, they are very excited because they see a lot of opportunity, the children curious, and the pastor, the, uh, everybody, you know, is involved and they want to use solar cooker. Next. And this is at the hospital uh, where the doctors and the nurses, you know, uh, doctors and nurses, they are very interested in solar cooking uh, in Haiti because, you know, they know the health effect that can protect their patient. So they are very excited. Everyone wants to have a solar oven. And we provide not only the knowledge, but the oven are already available at the community center. Next. Uh, this is Fredno. Fredno did had nothing to do <laughs> with solar cooking, but with Dr. Uh, Stillman, David Stillman loved Fredno's uh, photos. So Fredno now is making video and is uh, is what he want to be. He said he's a solar chef, and I agree with him. I give him the title. He's in competition with me that he's a better solar cook than me. He's making, this is the type of empowerment. This is the type of innovation we want. Somebody like Fedno who can take it away. He's young, he can share with his friend and family. Uh, next. This is at the University of Notre Dame. We include stu students at the university. They have a, a course they have a course, Sustainable Solar Cooking, uh, Sustainable Development Solar Cooking course. They know how to make solar cooker. They're exposed to all type of solar cooking. And uh, we really, uh, they're really excited. Students learn and go to their community and share uh, their knowledge and share their, their knowledge and skill on solar cooking. Next. Well, we cannot do things without collaboration. We cannot promote solar cooking in Haiti without collaboration, which is ex extremely important. So with KDCK is my hometown organization. KDCK is my hometown organization. So everything I do is, is through KDCK. But I was introduced by solar cooking, by a uh, person helping people, Mike and Martha in Minnesota. And they've been with me since then. Uh, they know about solar cooking. They, can, they make solar cookers. They promote solar cooking. They have the skill. I can call them when I need them. They're always available. I have SCI provide resources, resources for and networking. Uh, this is extremely important. Uh, when, when to empower me, with the knowledge and the competence and the skill I have to work, uh, 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 to help with solar cooking. Um, when I was asked by uh, Notre Dame University of Henge uh, to write a curriculum on solar cooking, so who did I call? I called Dr. Alan Bigelow. He was there, he went, referred me to the website and to uh, Mary uh, and, and, and uh, Jennifer. I call Mike and Marta from Person Helping People, Dr. Uh, Dr. David Stillman from PPAF. He was right there fundraising to support all these projects. So it's extremely important to have collaboration because without knowledge, without skill, without funding, uh, without networking, um, it won't be possible to have all that uh, done, to have people energized, to have people want to solar cook. Since I came back, I went two weeks ago, I was in Haiti. I came back from Haiti and all these pictures are recent pictures that we I just uh, came from from there and they are very excited. People are calling me, they, they're buying solar, they, they want to buy solar cooker. Next. Yes, I am a nurse and uh, I am the chair of KDCK. I'm a CI Global Advisor. I represent for, uh, I'm a representative for PPAF and 
and person helping people in Haiti. And I'm academic advisor for uh, Notre Dame University, and if you want to contact me or you have any question, you can reach me at wasbazil00 at gmail.com. Next. Yes, I made it last year. I made the cover. <laughs> Thank you to, uh, to Kathy Poffer uh, because she helped me with a uh, biodigester. We have that biodigester program. When it's early in the morning, you can use uh, we made, they can make their own gas with, with organic waste, and then we, we use it in collaboration with solar cooking. So Ludi is the director of the, of the uh, community center. She is off-grid. She doesn't choose wood. She doesn't treat charcoal or propane. She only uses solar cooking and biogas uh, for, for cooking fuels. And next to him, is Manik. Manik teach English at the community center. He spent his whole month's salary to purchase his pot oven. Uh, and he's very excited. He uses it every day. Uh, he saves a lot of money. And his wife is happy. And I have my two friends there, Kefli and Salomon. They helped me prepare what was inside the oven. I was. Um, I was working and cooking. This is how much it's fun for me, and it's a hobby. It's a work for me. I really enjoy, and I thank SCI for promoting, uh, for uh, for provide resources, and uh, to provide um, resources and networking and make this possible. Thank you for listening, and I hope all of you use solar cooking. Thank you very much, Rose. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Allen. Yes, your enthusiasm just shines through. And uh, we will move right on to our next speaker, uh, who I, we've enjoyed working with together, Dr. David Stillman at the Public Private Alliance Foundation. Dr. David Stillman is the executive director. So David, come on in and uh, I'll, I'll advance the slides for you. And there we are. So it is such a pleasure to be here with this great group and this great seminar today. Uh, I hope I'm unmuted now, am I? Yes, you're unmuted. Oh, very good. So uh, I want to talk about progress in solar cooking in Haiti. And you can tell from several of our other speakers, Rose, and Fedno and Lurdi, that good work is underway. The Public Private Alliance Foundation, or PPAF, is a New York based 501c3 nonprofit and a Solar Cookers International Associate. We're recognized by the United Nations Economic and Social Council and the UN Department of Global Communications. We're a member of the Clean Cooking Alliance, hosted by the UN Foundation, and we are a participant in the Global Compact. The, in Haiti, we work with Haitian and US collaborators in several ways. We support university teaching and field work on solar cooking and biodigesters for biogas and garden fertilizer. We support solar cooking and sewing classes at a training institution for children of low-income families. And we support an organization that has established an off-grid community center. That organization is KDCK, led by today's fellow speaker, Rose Basile. And you heard also from the directrice, Lurie Racine. The video you saw from Fedno Lubin shows that most families in Haiti have to depend on charcoal for daily cooking. This leads to respiratory disease and massive deforestation. PPAF and collaborating organizations take actions to help these families escape that trap by solar cooking to reduce the need for charcoal. Next slide, please. PPAF 
is engaged in many things, including international seminars. But today I want to highlight recent work on data collection, development of a Haitian solar cooking cookbook, local surveys, and demonstrations of solar cooking. These draw upon collaborators, volunteers, and the resources and encouragement from our friends in Solar Cookers International. Next slide. Fedno and others prepare 12 or more solar cooking tests each month on a format we developed. He sends us reports and photos by WhatsApp. Next slide. We now have enough depth and variety of information to begin drafts of recipe pages. These illustrate the practicality of solar cooking and itemize the ingredients and directions for tasty dishes. The testing and results are at the level of low income families who typically don't realize how sunshine can cook a good meal and save money and, and well being that is otherwise spent on charcoal. Having a lot of calls coming in here, which I'm going to ignore. Next slide, please. Oh, before you go to the next slide, Alan, this is our, uh, back up just a moment. So this is a, a picture of a fish stew that is prepared on solar cooking. And uh, to the right side of the page is our data sheet, which is sent in to us by WhatsApp 12 times or more a month. Uh, this past month, it's been 17 times. Next slide. A call for volunteers in New York to help edit and assemble pages inspired several to join us in helping to prepare a solar cooking cookbook. You see it, two pages draft, corrections yet to be made, of course, with pictures of the process and the results of solar cooking the uh, traditional Haitian independence uh, dish, soup jumu, and uh, on the right side, the chicken and tomato sauce, um, both of which show uh, in English for the present what is to be put in and what's to be done, and with pictures to show what the result is. We're glad for volunteers to help share the effort and widen the circle of influence beyond the work that is being done by Fedno and his neighbors and his family. We aim for these illustrated sheets of recipes to be useful initially with teams that we're already working with in Haiti and to help promote solar cooking possibilities internationally. Next slide. Regarding surveys, and you've heard Alan and others talk about the survey capabilities from Solar Cookers International. Regarding surveys, we've taken the SCI survey materials for user surveys and needs assessment surveys, modified them a bit for use in Haiti, and devised ways to conduct and report on the surveys by cell phone or computer. We have tested the surveys with several Haitian colleagues and have given the user survey a first run in Cote de Fer at the community center uh, that Rose has spoken about. Next, we'll administer the user's survey in Jacmel, where Fedno lives, and then in Hanch with persons who have received solar cookers through our efforts there. Next slide. As for demonstrations, our collaborators in Jacmel, Cote de Fer, and Hanch have conducted sessions with families and with local institutions. Uh, you saw from Rose something about the community center um, and uh, staff of a hospital. 
But in Hatch, uh, you see in this picture, uh, Elie Joseph uh, at a demonstration where he prepared two dozen eggs in two sessions of one dozen each uh, at an orphanage uh, to the, uh, the, the enjoyment of all present. And, and he has also made a presentation at a maternity center outside Hatch, which again, was very well received. Next slide. And here you see Fedno uh, at uh, the community center in Cote de Fer, where he has led so nicely a group of children who, as Rose says, uh, taught young that solar cooking is a good thing. Charcoal will be left behind. Next slide. So PPAF, seen here with the information on how to contact me, we're glad to engage with Solar Cookers International and with others in seminars and projects and on public policy issues to implement the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Participation in this seminar provides an excellent opportunity for that. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Dr. David Stillman. We really appreciate you sharing your voice and your time and for all the work that you've been doing. So thank you. And I would like to invite another way that you all can uh, be a part of Solar Cookers International's advocacy efforts. And you are welcome to visit our high level political forum virtual exhibition booth. So one of the advantages of having these events virtually is that anybody can join and stop by our exhibit booth at any point in time from anywhere around the world. And you can see some stunning photographs of work that's being done all around the world. So I invite you to to check it out and also to share it with your friends and colleagues and anyone who you think might be interested in learning more about solar cooking. One of the questions that we got is how to engage with Solar Cookers International. Um, so if we can go to the next slide, please. You're probably thinking, gosh, there's so much information that I got during this presentation. What do I do with it? And the great news is there's so many different things that you can do. So one of the easiest things to do is to sign up for more information. And that is a way to stay in touch with Solar Cookers International. So there's the link right here. You can also go to our website, solarcookers.org. And in the footer, there is a get our news uh, button and link, and you can fill out the form. And that way you can hear about other events like this when they're about to happen. Um, many of us have talked about the wealth of resources that are available through Solar Cookers International. Uh, that includes our website, solarcookers.org, as well as the Solar Cooking Wiki, which Mindy talked about with about 1800 pages of information at solarcooking.org. And you can learn so much. We encourage you to check it out. Of course, we can't do this important work without our really valued supporters. So. Please, if you're able to go to solarcookers.org slash donate and make a gift today to make solar cooking a reality for those 2.6 billion people. We encourage and invite you to join the SEI Association. This is an important aspect of that networking, access to resources. Um, also, as Alan mentioned, Consult SEI, we've got about 35 years of experience in best practices for solar cooking. Um, and we're happy to help you in your endeavors um, to have the greatest impact that you're working towards. Please include solar cooking in your individual organization and country's work, support, and policies. Um, we are all solar cooks as well, so we encourage you to do that as well as telling others about it and seeing how you can incorporate it in what you do. Um, and of course, there's the opportunity to sponsor events like this. Um, you got the chance to meet our wonderful development director, Lynn Slidem. Um, so please feel free to reach out to her at any point in time if you're interested in making an impact like this. All right, well, thank you everybody so much for joining. Um, I feel very fortunate that we were able to answer many of the questions through the question and answer section that we had, which is great. Um, and I do just wanna say a very big thank you to all of our speakers, our global advisors, our board of directors, our United Nations representatives, you for attending, our associates, our supporters, our volunteers, and our collaborators. I hope you all have a wonderful day and thank you so much.